Praise the Lord. The Bible says that let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You guys breathing this morning? <laughs> Let's praise. <laughs> let everything that has breath praise the Lord. God said, let everything that has breath praise the Lord.
You're a good, good father. 
no shame, there's no embarrassment. I've been down there on my, on my knees crying out to God over the last 13 years about, that I've been serving the Lord, praying and crying out to God more times than I can count. I, I don't even know. Been there. Linda, she tells a story, she'll, she'll tell you she got saved over and over again when she first went to the altar every week for, for months on end, right? And getting saved over and over again. <laughs> Amen? Amen? This is where we worship the King. Amen? Amen? Let's do it. Father, your presence is welcome in this place. Have your way in, your, in the hearts of your people, God. We pray, yes, Lord, against every Spirit. thing that's binding for our attention, God. Yeah, and we surrender to you. Have your way in this place. We take authority. We take authority over this place, God. Lord, every, every demonic presence and every uh, thing that would try to uh, steal your people's joy, we pray against sudden fear. Sudden fear. The enemy comes loud. He comes to try and try to knock you off your block. He tries to come at you sudden. Let me just say this. The Lord is gentle. He's quiet. He's loving. We thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. God, we pray, Lord, that your presence would come and melt the mountains like wax. The mountains that are before us, the things that are too overwhelming for us. God, we pray that you just melt them in your presence. All praise and glory in Jesus' name.
guys catch on to it. It's an awesome song. Yahweh. Hallelujah. Spirit of Jesus. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
all fears dissipate. Two different age groups, they'll let you know back there as they go. Um, I just continue to be encouraged about what God is doing. Not only in my life personally and what he does, but it's a continual reminder. You know, uh, life is not easy. You know, I'm, I, have you ever received a promise from God? You know, either personally God spoke to you in your prayer life, maybe through the Word, Scripture jumps off the pages of the Bible, and it's like, oh my gosh, that was for me. Or maybe um, if you guys are, um, uh, you know, have operated or been in a church where there's, you know, a prophetic word, and maybe a prophetic word comes across, and uh, God, you know, you know that, that God was using a human to speak into your life and uh, speaking through them, and. Uh, you're like, oh my gosh, your heart just kind of cleaved to that. It was in the boundaries of the word, and you knew that that was God. Anybody ever had a word like that? Only one, two, a couple? Okay, there's a couple more. Man, I've, man, I've had words like that. 
If you if you're like me, if you've uh, had a word like that, you'll know that oftentimes, pay close attention. Oftentimes, your circumstances will obviously will, will go the opposite way to what the word is saying. Right? It's like oh, you got the word, and you think. We think that, oh gosh, tomorrow, you might have the word on Sunday, and I feel it's by Thursday, it's going to be wrapped up, sewed up, and it's going to be happening. You know, that's how God works. He's so omnipotent, right? He can do things, you know, super quick and get things accomplished like that, you know? On my time frame, I'm going to do it how I want, when I want, on the time frame I want, so that I can get through this trial and be through it, and God's done. Man, thank you, Lord, for doing that. Amen. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Let's call it a wrap. I'm walking in all that God's yeah. promised me. Yeah. <laughs> that's not how God works usually. I'm reminded of uh, King David, who was uh, Shepherd David to begin with. David was on the backside of the wilderness when King Saul uh, was anointed the first king of Israel. David comes in and he's anointed to be king of Israel, but he's anointed to be king. He's not anointed as king yet. So he gets a promise, right? He gets a word, like we're talking about, right? He gets a, a word that says, hey, I'm going to be something, right? But then several years and trials later, the circumstances go completely different. He's got the current king chasing him, wandering through the wilderness, trying to seek his life, trying to murder him, literally murder him. Several attempts at taking his life. I, I wonder if David ever saw, as a matter of fact, you can probably read the Psalms and, and find several chances. I don't think David ever wavered in it, right? But he's several opportunities where he's in the Psalms and you can read his emotional roller coaster. He's up one minute and he's like, where are you, God, the next minute? And man, it's like things aren't lining up the way you said they were. And boy, oh gosh, you know, it's like it's just emotional roller coaster. David's going through it. He's got the prophetic word. He's got the promise. He's got everything that God has promised him, said to him. Yet, what's going on in my life? It's going completely different than I thought it would. God will always have to work in the man, the character that's needed to sustain what the responsibility of the man is called him to. Amen. 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 Because if you don't get, if you don't have the character formed in you first, when you get elevated to the place that you have to be to be able to operate in that anointing or anointing, operate in that promise, then then you the, the character will never follow it, follow it. Ecclesiastes says that uh, that a little uh, fly, a dead fly in the anointing oil, will cause it to stink. Right? It's great to have anointing oil. It's great to have power. It's great to have something. The anointing shatters the yoke. It shatters the thing. What's a yoke? A yoke is a thing. I think about a, the yoke of oxen, right? What they do. They bind two things together and they go wherever one goes, the other goes. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to be separated. Right? So people are yoked to things. People have things in their life they're yoked to. They might be vices. You might be yoked to something right now. But it's the anointing and the presence of God and the word of God that begins to shatter the yoke. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And begins to yoke us to Christ. For his burden is easy and his yoke is light. Amen. 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 And as God begins to operate inside of the hearts of people and as we surrender to him and allow him to do the work that's needed to form the character inside of us. To get us to the promise that he promised us. Oh, praise God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Come on. Yeah. The thing is, here's the question, people, because we're human, Right? Can we sustain it? Can we go through it? David went through a lot to get to where he had to get to. So your circumstances will oftentimes not line up with what God's word said in the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But God is true and he is not a liar. Yes. He's not a man that he should lie. His promises are yes and amen. Yeah. Don't give up, church. Don't, I, I don't even plan on that. I don't even know where we're going. Don't give up on God because he will not give up on you. Amen. God will continue to work in you. He, the, the work that he does will continually operate inside of you until the day that he completes it. The question is, are we willing to surrender it? If we can surrender, surrender to the work of God, he'll continue to do the work inside of us. Amen? Amen. Kind of lined up with today's message. We're going to go right into it. We'll take the offering later. Um, I will not fear. Last week, if you remember, maybe the last couple weeks, we talked a lot about what's going on in the world, a lot of uh, end time calamities, a lot of things that are kind of changing rapidly in our world, in our present world. And we read the Bible from um, 
and know that God is a, pro- a God of prophecy, a God that uh, he says things that have been fulfilled and things that will be fulfilled in the future. Um, you can kind of see the, the pages of the Bible all over the news, news, start, news line, right? You may watch the news, it's like calamity after calamity, and things are going crazy, haywire. Um, things on the earth are getting very difficult. And we talked a little bit about that. We talked about the, uh, the beginning of sorrows, Matthew chapter 24. It says that all these things will be the beginning of sorrows. Wars and rumors of wars. Look at the Middle East is going crazy right now. There's all kinds of things going on yep. and happening over there. Yep. There will be pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Um, all these things are kind of going on right now, and they're kind of a leading, or a, 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 a leading up to those end times. But here's the thing. I want, and I don't know how I left people last week. I want to make sure, and I'm sure I said this, but I want to kind of dedicate this service to this. We're not going to fear these things. No, right. We're not called to fear these things. Yeah. These things, um, they're, they're here, they're present, and I don't know how much they'll affect us. I can't promise you that. That's God's business. What God does in your life personally and how he does it, I'm here for you. I'll be here for you until the end. Believe God. But I can't promise how it will affect you or, you know, the, the, the thing. But here's the thing. Praise God that this world is not our promise and this is not our hope. Yeah. Praise God that the world to come, that, that the promises to come, yeah. and eternity to come, that's our hope. That's Amen. our treasure. Those yeah. are the yeah. things that we look for. Those are the things that we invest in. Yeah. It's time right now to, well, we were talking a little bit about identity earlier. Right now, more than ever, we need to get that solidified because if that will not be solidified, you will be shaken. I'd be foolish to not tell you. I'd be, I'd be, I would be unloving to not tell you. You got to sew that up right now. Yes. You got to get that straight. You got, and, and, and here's the thing: I can help you. I can talk you through it, but you got to do it. That's between you and the Lord. I tell my 17 year old daughter, I cannot save her. She's got to have her own relationship with the Lord. Right? Yep. You know, she was under some covering for a while, but she's 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 a, she's a young adult now. She's doing, she's moving in that direction. It, she's got to have her own relationship with the Lord. Yeah. Right. We have to all have our own relationship with the Lord. Your pastor won't save you. Uh, your, your priest won't save you. Your brother, your mother, your father won't save you. Mm-hmm. Only your father in heaven is going to be able to be. Yeah, and it's a time right now to, to sew it up and make sure that yes, we're, we're secure in him. That's right. We're secure in him. Mm-hmm. And the only thing to fear is that if you are not <laughs> secure in him. And usually you can kind of tell. Right? I've shared this before. Some of you may have heard this. But I sat bedside with people who were basically on their way out. And usually, um, and if I don't know that person very well, I'll usually ask where their faith is. I'd ask where their faith is. And I've seen people, you can usually tell. Because the fear will be zooming off of them. They know that they're on their last way. You know, they're on their way out. And the fear that is on them, you can just recognize. And they'll usually say, how's your relationship with the Lord? I know it's not very good. What can we just what can we do right now? We'll just get that we'll just get that right. Better now than never. Yeah. Right? But even right now, as we sit here as healthy people, yeah. if you're healthy, I don't know. Right? But as we sit right here in this room, right? Better now than ever to sew that up. You never know what could happen on your way home to church. Exactly. On your way home from church. Yeah. Things happen. <laughs> Every single day. <laughs> Things happen. Pray they don't. We never know. So all these things are kind of occurring in the earth. There's definitely a shaking that is happening. But as I said at the opening of the service, I believe it's God's mercy um, that is being exemplified um, right now in the earth. If you read your Bible and you know what's going on, it's like an act of God's mercy, mercy to say, hey, this is the time to tidy it up. This is, this is the time. This is the fourth quarter, if you will. Right? There's not going to be another opportunity. right? Like This is the time to sew it up. Right now. Because once you get on the other side, there is no opportunity. So God gave us an example to kind of do that. So here's the thing that we have, right? We have this opportunity given by God as an act of his mercy to sow these things up. He said, what are we going to do about it? Because Paul's in our court. He did everything he needed to do right at the cross. He laid his life down. He sacrificed his life. He gave his life for our sins that he might die instead of us. But we have to send you to see the gift. Right? And we know, are we in relationship? And here's a real simple question. Are we in relationship with God? Or are we running from God and ashamed of God? 
Are we hiding from God as Adam and Eve did, ashamed? Or are we coming to Him? Listen, don't, you don't have to clean your life up before you come to God. That's right. You do not have to clean your life up before you come to God. You come to God and let Him clean your life yeah. up. Yeah. You come to God and let Him take care of the rest. Yeah. There is zero reason for anybody not to. The only reason that people don't is either that, well, I was going to say either their pride or their sin, but pride is sin too. So, <laughs> you know, but it's like because they, they either think they can do it themselves, they think they're all right. Oh, I don't need him, or they're sin. So the only, the only thing that's keeping us from from a relationship with God. I shared this uh, the other night, and I don't know if I kind of fully went through this. I was talking. I used to go out into Sonora um, on the streets up there. I mean, my wife and I were from there. And, uh, you know, we would, uh, I lived in Sonora probably 20 plus years, and I would go on the, the main street out there, and uh, there was a season, a time, where I would go out and handle, ha- hand out gospel tracts. By the way, there's gospel tracts out there for anybody who likes to do that kind of thing. Um, I would go out and hand, hand out gospel tracts, and, and occasionally I would feel led to talk to someone, kind of strike up a conversation with someone. I wouldn't do it to everybody, but, you know, more often than not, I would just get the gospel tract in my hand. Anybody heard of gospel tract, right? They're really great. Tools to use. Out there, they're free to have. I'll buy more. If you guys use them all, we'll get more. Um, but um, yeah, absolutely. I care about souls, man. Really. And um, I remember this one specific conversation that I was having with somebody. Um, the person was obvious homosexual. It was just it was abundantly clear, right? And just like there was no denying it. And I had somebody with me um, that was kind of with me, you know, going out and sharing the gospel with these people. And I was talking to this person, and uh, never once did I address their homosexuality. As I would never once address a drunkard's alcoholism or someone living in fornication, sex before marriage, I wouldn't address that. What I would say is that if you come to God with the right heart and you begin to repent and put your faith in Him, then you that's let right. God work on those Amen. things, right? right? And he'll begin yeah. to deliver you out yeah, of them. He'll, you out. he'll put a spirit that's inside right. you so that you won't want to do those things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So I don't deal with it. I don't deal with the homosexuality. I don't let God deal with the homosexuality. You know what I'm going to ask him? I'm going to ask him about the Ten Commandments. Right. I'm going to do everything that puts us on a level playing field. Have you lied? Have you stolen? Have you used God's name in vain? Jesus said, if you look upon a person with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. If you hated anybody, you committed murder in your heart already. Yeah. And I don't think you walked into the church saying you were a murderer, did you? <laughs> well, we used to tend to think about the people on the 9 o'clock news as murderers, right? If you've ever done these things, right, those are the things that are going to condemn you before God if you haven't put your faith in Christ. Preach. So let's get all the table right now, right? <laughs> right? So you can't say that you've never heard. Those are the things that will condemn us when we stand before God if we've never repented and put our faith in Christ. That Ten Commandments, that's what it is. As a matter of fact, that's what, that's what uh, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy. He said, the law is not for the righteous person. We're righteous because we're in Christ, when we're in Christ, right? The law is not for the righteous person, but for the lawless, for the sinner, for the this, for the that, for the that. He names a bunch of things, right? He says, and the law, if used lawfully, is for them. In other words, the law isn't for the one who's not speeding out there. Nobody needs that if they're not speeding. But if they're speeding, right, then that's what the law is for. You use it to kind of, you know, for the ones breaking the law, right? So praise Jesus that if we come to him with a, with a, with a pure heart and ask him, then he will deliver us from our sin. He will begin to work in you and get those things out of you. Praise, praise the Lord. I don't know how I ended up there. Anyways, um, I will not fear. Luke chapter 21, we're going to read out of there to kind of uh, talk about this. So, um, and there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress of nations. Can you say, can anybody say that there's distress of nations? I don't even watch the news that much. I really don't. But I do kind of glimpse it once in a while, like my Samsung TV, when I turn it on. It goes to this automatic guide. Like, I just stream everything. I just watch, like, Amazon or I watch Hulu or something like that. But anyways, when you turn on my TV, it's like this built-in TV that's in there that I didn't even pay for. It's, like, free or whatever. But it's, like, stuck on the news. And I don't know. Sometimes it stays on for a minute. And, like, it's all bad news. Every minute of it. It's, like, 
off the charts, haywire, crazy, bad news. And sometimes it stays on for a minute, and I'm like, what the heck? Did anybody notice there's distress of nations? Yeah. The world's going crazy. Per with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring. Notice verse 26. It says that men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming with a uh, with a, in a cloud, sorry, with power and great glory. Verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. It's the convergence of signs, and that's not what this message is about, but it's the convergence of signs and the, 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 the chaotic... What we talked about last week about the beginning of sorrows is actually the word sorrows is translated as birth pains. So as the earth travails in labor, you can kind of tell that the birth of this thing and his coming, he came once, he's coming again. Yep. Just so we're all on the same page. He came once, he's coming again. And he says that when the uh, labor contractions or the labor pains get, begin to increase both in intensity and in frequency, that that will be the time that he's coming. And really, we kind of, uh, oftentimes here in America, we attribute to everything to here. Yeah, sure, we're byproducts of that. We get, you know, we get a lot of things going on, right? People are people, and they're all across the globe, and that, that happens um, when, it, when it comes to things that affect people. But really, when you're looking at the nation of Israel and the Middle East, that's really the prophetic time clock that God operates on. Yeah. That's, that's when you really need to kind of pay attention. Has anybody noticed that there's a war going on in the Middle East? And, yeah what's going on in Israel right now. Yeah. That's something to really pay attention to. Yeah. It's something to kind of really kind of, you know, lift up your head and kind of be ready for. But here's the thing. You don't have to fear. If we have fear, listen, if we have fear, it's a good barometer of where our faith is. And I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm saying that to hopefully write you today. Right? I'm saying that to hopefully get you in the right place. Because if we have a fear about those things, listen, look at what it says in verse 26. Let's read that again. Men's hearts failing them from fear and expectation of things which are coming on the earth. Their hearts begin to fail them. They begin to drop. Look at the economy. Look at the job place. Look at, the, look at what's going on in the world. Look at all of the wars. How am I going to be affected? Look at the wildfires that are going on. Look at, all, you know, look at this. Look at that. Look at that. Look at the 9 o'clock news. Look at the 9 o'clock news for an hour. You will be like... What is going on, right? Like, I do not... Listen, end times prophecy preachers need to be another breed. They do. Because they kind of want to look at the signs of what's going on so that they can share with people, but they've got to be firm in their word because they don't want to get overly succumbed to the fear that they're reading about and seeing what's going on inside of the word. You know, it's like, I was talking to another pastor about this, and I was like, hey, you know, the Bible gives us all these prophetic events and everything like that, but it doesn't give us the details. We're living the details right now, right? It doesn't tell you that this, this, and this, and this, and this, exactly like this is going to happen, right? But it's like the details are going to happen, right? The details are kind of filling in through your news headlines, but it gives you some main bullet points of what's happening inside of the Bible. Right. And these things are happening, and you've got to be firm in your word to be able to handle that. We should not be in fear. There's not a reason to. As a matter of fact, we should be in hope and expectation yeah. of what's occurring right now. Lifting up our head and saying, hey, he's coming soon. Right, um, yes. He's coming soon. Yes. Right? What, whatever will, whatever can be shaken, will be shaken. You hear me? Whatever can be shaken in your life, will be shaken. If you feel like something's being shaken in your life, it's time to address it now. You have the opportunity. To it. If something's being shaken in your life, if you're putting something before God, and God is shaking something in your life, excuse me, and he's doing something, right? It's like it's time to like, hey, what's going on? It's a good indicator that something's not right. And here's the great news. You don't have to hide from God. God loves you. God loves you. He's a God of love. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of peace. He's all those things that we were worshiping about and Walter was exhorting about, right? He's all those things. But listen, we got to come on his terms. We've got to come through him. We've got to come through his son. We can't come any other way. Anyone who comes who tries to come another way is a thief and a robber. Mm -hmm. We have to come through him and him alone. We have to come on his terms. And he will give you peace. He will give you the 
Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, it says that he'll give you a peace that transcends the understanding of mankind. When all of your friends who may not be saved or whatever like that, you know, your acquaintances and the thing, people that you know, right? All of them are like freaking out because of all of a sudden, why aren't you freaking out? I don't know, man. I just kind of trust in God. I read the Bible and I mean, I know these things are going on, but man, I got peace about it. Man, I got a hope that's not in this world. It's not in, I'm not investing in him. I'm investing in him. I got a peace that's, that's just kind of, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just there. I, I'm resting in him. He's got this under control. I'm like the Apostle Paul. I, I expect everybody to be like this, but like, hey, it's a, I want to go home and be with him. But it's more desire that I be here with you right now. But hey, man, you want to take my life today? Praise the Lord. Please celebrate. And please don't try to raise me from the dead. <laughs> don't try to raise me from the dead. There'll be no miracles with that. There's nothing to be. So then you gotta let the air out a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> but we're in a time of shaping, and I think it's a time of great God's grace and mercy. Praise the Lord for that. I'm gonna go through a couple points, and we'll probably get right through this real quick. This is important. When you fear God, you will fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you will fear everything else. You ever kind of notice, and I stole that from Oswald Chambers, I put it up there. I mean, that guy had it, he nailed it, I'm giving him credit for it. So, I'm not taking it. But I was like reading about this, and I was like, man, that's pretty good. When you fear God, you will fear nothing else. When you have a reverence and a respect for God and understanding who he is, there's nothing that can stop you. King David says, I will run over, I will run over a troop and jump over a wall. I'm so filled with confidence, not in myself, and not what I can accomplish, but I'm so filled with the confidence that he instills inside of me and what he's given me and the, and the platform that he's given me and the authority that he's given me and the identity that he's given me and the role that he's given me and the responsibilities that he's given me, that I have the confidence to walk it forward and move through this. Amen. That I don't have to be shaken by the things that are going on in this earth. I don't have to be shaken by the things that are around me. I don't have to be shaken. Do I struggle sometimes? Yes. Right? The enemy tries to come suddenly and he tries to knock me off with fear. And he tries to whisper things to me just like he does to you. And he tries to knock me off my block just like he tries to knock you off your block. And there's times where I kind of succumb to that for a moment. But let's not let it happen for a period of time. Right? Because God is able to work inside of you and he's able to fill you with such a confidence that you can walk on your two own feet and say, I know who I am inside of Christ. Yeah. You ain't going to take my, yeah. my inheritance away from me, devil. Yeah. Yeah. There ain't nobody in this world or nobody out of there that can take you out of the hands of God and remove you from the love of God. Yeah. It's time to yeah. throw that out right now and put your hope inside of him and completely yeah. be filled with his confidence. Yes. Because when you fear him and you respect him and you reverence him and you say, I'm going to live a life for him, then all of the things and the calamities of this world and everything that's going on isn't going to affect you. Uh-huh. It's not going to do that. But when you, when you don't fear him and you don't have reverence for him and you don't respect him and you don't obey him, then you should begin to fear everything else. That's why I say it's a good barometer to tell where you're at right now. Uh-huh. Yeah. Listen, and I'm not trying to beat you up with the word. I'm trying to tell you that's how you tell. Do right. something about it. Put your hope inside of him. Change the direction and surrender and humble yourself before him. Because you need him. We need him. If we fear circumstances, the results will speak for themselves. If we fear the circumstances, that, listen, we are no different than the world and those who have not put their faith in Christ when it comes to the things that we face. It's just that the things that we face, we have an advocate on our side. We have an advocate on our side who is doing, can do miracles. I believe in a God who does miracles. I believe that he can do things, but then I, hey, beyond my pay grade, but sometimes he doesn't, sometimes he doesn't. And, I, and sometimes there's things that we won't know until we get to the other side. And sometimes we have to just be okay with that. I can't explain everything. But man, I know that word to be true. And I've seen it operate in my life. And I've seen it do things. I've seen it change people's hearts. I've seen it do miracles inside of people's hearts where it's transformed their life and completely take a, a, a pride, prideful man and break him down and make him a humble person, make him somebody that's exposed to God and vulnerable to God, that needs God and is totally reliant upon God. I've seen God melt that person's heart like wax. I believe the word of God and I believe it does what it's intended to do. 
Godly fear is the beginning of wisdom. Yeah. Wisdom is knowledge just applied appropriately. Have you ever seen that? Right? Proverbs 3 says that. I think it's Proverbs 3, Proverbs 1. Anyways, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Hey, people, there's a lot more people. I know I'm kind of not your polished pastor, if you will. I'm okay with that. Dave will tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he tells me all the time. I'm not your polished pastor, but I can tell you right now, there's a lot of people that have way more knowledge than me up here. They might, they might I'm not their judge, might miss heaven by 18 inches because they couldn't get it to here. Couldn't, couldn't get it. You have, to get, you have to get that knowledge from here to here. You have to get that embedded inside of you. When you have God inside of your heart, hey, knowledge is good. My people, the Bible said, my people perish for lack of knowledge because they don't have understanding. Knowledge is good, but wisdom is knowledge appropriately applied. Timing, application, allowing God to do what he wants to do. We have to take God's knowledge and apply it at the appropriate time and have wisdom about it. Have wisdom of our surroundings and our audience and everything like that, right? There's wisdom inside of that. It's the fear of the Lord. To have a good, reverent respect of the fear of the Lord. So that when you do, when you read that word, it does travel from here to here. Yeah. Right? Because that's how it does get from here to here. Is when we have that reverent respect for him. We have to be willing to willingly, sorry, that was not it. To willingly put ourselves in a position to receive instruction from the Lord. To apply it, and if we don't receive uh, and if we don't receive his discipline uh, to correct us, we have to be able to apply his word and allow him to correct us. You know, the Bible says, and I know that this is in popular preaching, but it says that he chastises those whom he loves. Mm -hmm. It says that if he does not correct us or discipline us, we might not be his children. So the fact that you get corrected by the Lord is actually an evidence that you belong to the Lord and you're allowing him to work inside of you. Right, right. That's actually great news, <laughs> right? That we would allow God to work in us in such a way that we would allow him to correct us and we would say, praise the Lord. Thank you for your correction. I'm glad I'm still yours. Amen. You haven't disowned me. <laughs> Anyways. The pain of regret will be greater than any pain of discipline. We don't, let's not ever live in a place of regret. There'll be people that wish that they heard the gospel one more time in that place of anguish when they when God put the wrath on us. Man, I wish I could hear that one more time. I wish I could hear that on the other side before you came back and I would do something about it. Because what we were talking about last week is that we're leading into a place where there's the, 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 the most terrible time the world has ever uh, would live. The, 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 I'm sorry. A short circuit there. Um, we're leading into a time, a, the uh, most terrible time that the world will ever see. Yeah. We're leading into that time. And I would be, I think, unloving if I didn't tell you that, right, that we have to do that. So when we, um, when we have fear of those things that are coming upon us, it's a good barometer to tell us what's going on around us and what's going on inside of us, where our hope and our trust is. <laughs> the pain of regret, I'm going to say that again, the pain of regret will always be greater than the pain of any discipline that God might give you. The pain of discipline is actually really good. Receive it. Be joyful and glad that you are a child of God. Amen? Amen. Point number two. I want to talk more specifically, not to circumstances, but to men. Because humanity in general, Christians included, oftentimes fear men. It's easy to be on a Sunday morning, man, filled with faith, praising the Lord, we're in a bunch of people who agree with us here, right? We're all in here kind of praising Jesus. And it's like, man, in this room, this is this is where we get trained up to bring what we learn and bring it out there. Yes. And to be that. We aren't supposed to kind of let everything that we just got instructed about, let everything that kind of was falling on our hearts, let it go out there and, and then be compromising out there. That's not how it's supposed to operate. We're supposed to operate in such a way that we take from here and apply it out there. That we wouldn't let the moment of decision or the wide in the road that we're facing at that very moment that we would stand for God rather than stand and please men. If we fear the opinion of men, we will obey them and not the Lord. 
You want to know what I, if you were to ask me, and I know you didn't, but I'm up here and you're not. <laughs> if you were to ask me what's wrong with America, that's it right there. Yeah. This so-called Christian nation is a bunch of people that claim Christianity but don't live Christianity. Yeah. And it's the reason that we're having the problems that we're having as our country. Because the Bible says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Think about that. I think that we reap blessing for years, but slowly but surely, God's stand has been lifted upon us. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because of millions of babies that have been born in this nation. Because of the, the things that we've done, the things that we've chosen, the, the, the Sunday you know, pristine services that we kind of come to and then we walk out there and we live nothing like the, the God that we serve, yeah. claim to serve. Right, right. Yeah. That would be the primary responsibility for what's going on inside of our nation, I would say. So what do we do when we're faced with a, de uh, with a decision? When we're faced inside of a moment of, you know, should I choose what's right or should I compromise a little to kind of please my unbelieving friends? What do I do in that moment? I want to just kind of talk a little bit about a, uh, when it talks about the fear of men. I want to talk a little bit about um, King Saul's demise. And for the lack of, or for the sake of time, and I would I would encourage you to go read this on your own. Go read First Samuel 15. Um, but basically, Saul was the first king of Israel. The people of the country clamored for a king. God didn't want to give him a king. He said, you guys aren't other, like, like other nations. You guys have a God. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you guys want a king like other nations? I'll give you a king. So God put Saul in place. And they had a king. God, through the prophet Samuel, gave Saul um, something to do. Let me go back real quick. I don't want to get ahead of it. God, through, the, through uh, Saul... Uh, asked him to uh, to attack and completely obliterate an unbelieving nation, and a nation that uh, attacked Israel when they came out of Egypt. You ever notice that God always goes back to Egypt, like often, like thousands of years later? He's like, let's go back and look at that time. <laughs> Anyways, kind of parenthetical there, but um, he says that he says, you know, hey, I want you to go obliterate uh, the Amalekites. It needs have everything. Men, women, children, goats, sheep, all their livestock, everything like that. Completely destroy them. And Saul disobeys. And he keeps King Agag alive. And he keeps the choicest livestock alive as well. So Saul does this. He disobeys the Lord. He thinks he obeys the Lord. As a matter of fact, the prophet Samuel gets a word from God at that moment. And he says, I want you to go, I actually regret that I've made him king. I think it uses the word repent, if I'm not mistaken, which means he's changed his mind about it. God can change his mind. Does it repent me that I, that I actually called King Saul to, to be king? So, Samuel, anguished by this, because this never give me bad news, it should be never fun. But Samuel's obedient to the Lord and he needs to go deliver this message to Saul. And he delivers this message to Saul. And Saul's first thing when he sees him, he says, hey, I obeyed the Lord. Look what I did. I obliterated everybody but the king and so a few poor sheep that some of my soldiers kept for themselves. He says, no, you didn't. As a matter of fact, your king's just going to be taken from you. You're not going to be this much longer. So when Samuel confronts Saul, Saul actually comes to a different conclusion. You can go to the next scripture. I want to just kind of, this is the result of it. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, and I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, what he's asked me to do. He goes, in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. I think it would always be prudent for us to kind of take a little, like, sanity check on our own faith and where we're at is are we obeying men rather than God? Because right now, right, and, and like I say with the problem with America, it seems like we're worried and, and, and concerned about offending everybody but God. Yeah. 
We're okay with offending God. We're okay with doing this and doing that. We're okay with doing this in our schools and doing that. Everything taken into consideration except for God with the choices that we make. Not in us, not us here in this room. I don't know. I can't speak for you, but I'm talking as a whole, generally speaking, right? That's what happens. Yeah. And God is looking for a people who are willing to stand on his principles. I don't care if you're the last person standing for his principles. Yes. I don't care if it's your, your, your leader, your boss, your pastor, your church. If they go haywire and they go onto the other side, you need to be the last one standing. God's looking for you to stand if you were the only one standing and the only Amen. one left. Yes. That would stand on his principles. Yes. Not in any fear of any person because of what they're telling you that they should do, how they should believe, or what you should believe, right? And that you should have it inside of you and still inside of you as the only voice that's saying, no, this is wrong. Amen. I can't do this. No, Amen. I can't compromise. Amen. You do what you want. You're responsible for you, but I'm responsible for me. You heard about, um, and I think this was when COVID was going on or whatever. Um, I read a lot of accounts and you know news stories or whatever. A good example of this, right? Is that there was a wedding cake maker that wouldn't make a cake for a gay gay, gay wedding. Aww. Just using it as an example. Listen, this. Praise God for those people. Yeah. They actually took it to court. Who is it that you should tell someone? I mean, you have the right to refuse service on a sign outside of a store that says that you can't, you know, we have the right to refuse service to anyone, right? And so you come without a t-shirt, and they'll say, well, we have to refuse service to you. But you say the moment you say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that business. It's just, hey, man, I hope you go find somebody. That's fine. Go ahead and go about your business, but I'm not doing it. I can't be a part of it. I can't be a part of that. I can't, I can't join you guys. I couldn't pastor you guys. I couldn't. You know, consummate the wedding or anything like that. I could not be a part of that at all, right? Praise God for those people who stood Amen. when they Amen. needed to. God's looking for some people that will stand, yes. not for a, a, a dime to do to do you right. know and take money at, at, right. at the business sake, right? To say, hey, listen, I'm going to make a stand and say I can't do that. That that, that right. crosses yeah. not my morals, God's morals, yeah. right? Yeah. You might disagree. I, there were things when I first came to the Lord, I'm like, no, I disagree. I can't. What? God's changed me. God's changed my heart. And, then, and just to, for clarity's sake, because I've used home session, I love people. Everyone. Yes. Just so we're all on the same page. It's not a home, you know, I'm not targeting them or anything like that. It's just an example I'm using. I believe that God can save people out of that. Yes. He will not, if He saves them, He will not leave them in that. There's countless stories of people being delivered and changing their mind about that, just like anything else, yeah. uh-huh. right? Uh-huh. Could they come in here and sit in the, on this church? Let us be a church that would be willing and lovingly yeah. enough, as long yeah. as they're in here, yeah. just listening to the message and allowing God to work inside of their hearts to do something that only God can do and to change them. Yeah. Yeah. Let us be that will that loves and cares for them now. Yeah. And they come in there. Now, there's a whole other story of you coming and trying to get this, and then we'll kind of talk on your barrier and get you out of here. You're trying to tell us that we need to believe that. that. No, otherwise, I'm telling you right now, that's what it is, right? It's like, we're loving. Yeah. You want to hear the good news? Hear the good news of Jesus. Yeah. He loves yeah. you. He cares for you. He'll get you right where you're at. He'll come and get you. And he'll, right. he'll swallow up every sin if you can just repent and put your faith in him. Yeah. Amen? Amen. In the Gospels, and I didn't write the address down, but the Bible says, Fear not him who has the power to kill the body, but fear him who has the power to cast your soul into hell. Let that sink in. We need to be a people who get to that point. But also, let us not be Peter, who at the moment when he succumbed to the fear of men, right? And Jesus prophesied and told him that you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows three times. In the night, Peter says, no, I won't do that. Just be real. Because people have asked, will you be able to stand in the moment when somebody says, deny your faith or die? And by the grace of the Lord, I hope so. But you'll find out right then of what you kind of invested in now. Amen? Yeah. Point number three, this will be the last one. I didn't write the scripture down. Oh, there we go. Cool. Thank you. You got it. Good job, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sometimes God doesn't remove our enemies because he wants to bless us in front of them. He's talking about fear, right? Sometimes you wonder why, you know, the enemies are still coming after you. Why they're still, you know, surrounding you. Why are you still dealing with some of the same things? Sometimes, sometimes, right? And you know, if you're spending time with God, you know. But sometimes you're just going through a trial. You're going through his test. Job went through a test. There was enemies that came after Job. There were enemies that kind of attacked him in his faith. He was the most uh, 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 righteous man living on the earth, following God with everything he could. He was obedient to God. He was always doing what the right thing. And, and God said, hey, have you tested my servant Job? Have you tried him? Ole. <laughs> I know. Near thing. Right? And through many trials and through things that Job went through, God ended up coming back and saying, listen, I'm going to prepare a table for you in this year, and I'm going to give you double of everything that you have. Sometimes God is not, hey, sometimes we, we believe God, right? And this is my mentality. It's the first five years of Christianity before God really had to work inside of me. My first five years of Christianity, man, it was so hard. It's like, we serve a God who's all-powerful, who's all-knowledgeable, and is everywhere. It's like, why does he change things like that? And God showed me that he's not a God in a box. He's not God in a genie. He's not succumbing to my wishes. As a matter of fact, he cares a lot more about the heart of you and forming character inside of you than he does about your circumstances. Yeah. He'll actually use the things that are going on around you to do something inside of you yeah. to get you to the character that he needs for you. Yeah. Amen? Amen? But listen, that does not mean that God doesn't want to bless you. God wants to bless you. And sometimes the enemies and the things that you're facing is he's just preparing a table right in the midst of those enemies to say, listen, I'm going to glorify myself through my servant David who continues to proclaim my name no matter what he's going through. There he is. He's lifting up his hands and he's still praising me. Yes. Amen. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to prepare a table and it's going to be a table of blessing and the enemies are going to look at him and they're going to begin to see what, is, what are you doing, God? Because he's still proclaiming his name. That's right. He's still lifting up his name. Sorry, David, I'm moving yeah. Just lifting him up, right? In the middle of that trial, in the middle of that storm, and everything that you're going through, you're not denying him. You're not saying, God, you know, Joe's wife, she sat there and she saw all the things that were going on, and she said, why don't you curse God and die? Listen, if your spouse says that, you say, you go ahead and do it. I'm, <laughs> I'm not denying my faith or my place in the kingdom for you. I'll tell you that right now. Right? I'm worshiping the King of Kings. Amen. 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 Sometimes God will move your enemies, but sometimes He doesn't. He wants to bless you right in this one. Amen. 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 God, you are a God of mercy and grace. And we just thank you for your gentleness, your kindness. We thank you that you are uh, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to everlasting life. God, I pray that the seeds of today's word land on fertile ground of softened hearts. That we would take these words, that we would do an inventory of our lives, our minds, our hearts, and where we're at with complete transparency before you. And that we would, from that, humble ourselves and say, God, I don't want to fear anymore. I don't want to fear these things. I want to fear you. I want to respect you. I want to honor you. I want to live for you so that you would fill me with so much confidence, Lord, that I would be able to run over a troop and run through a wall. God, I pray that anyone under the sound of my voice that has not put their hope in you Maybe they're sitting in this service. Maybe this is uh, foreign to them. Maybe they don't know you. Maybe they're distant from you. I pray, God, Lord, that today is the day that that changes. God, I pray that they take the words of the gospel of what you have done, God, that you came born of a virgin. You came as God in the flesh. You lived among men a sinless life. You took upon the sin of humanity. All the things that we have all done, you took upon yourself and you... Uh, uh, took all that condemnation, that sin, and you buried it on the cross. You had it crucified on the cross, and you had it buried in the tomb, excuse me. 
and that you rose from the dead and you defeated death. And through that proclamation and through our repentance of our own sin, Lord, we are saved and righteous, just as righteous as Jesus is. So God, we thank you for the righteousness that we have inside of Christ Jesus. The righteousness that you and only you can impute to mankind. We give you all praise and glory for that in Jesus' mighty name. And church said? Amen. 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 Thank you, Dave. Stan, can you come forward and take uh, this word?